Washington's smart about that, kind of balancing and bringing in both sides, both anti-federalists and federalists. Now, what I, I do about these two is that these two hate each other. They're going to grow to hate each other. They don't trust each other. They don't like each other. Jefferson thinks that he is just capital class. That wants to, his whole idea for creating a national government is to secure property and that he's going to pass policies that favor his class. So that's okay, but what he doesn't like is going to pass policies that favor his class at the expense of the average people. That's what bugs Jefferson. Jefferson is going to be the defender of this group down here, independent farmers and artisans, capital class, agrarian class. Call this the everlasting rivalry because all countries have, and all societies have a struggle that takes place on policy. Who's going to, what are the policies of the government going to be? Who are they to benefit? Got some other folks. They got uh, Henry Knox from Massachusetts, the same Secretary of War. But uh, Washington is really balancing out the different states, setting up a tradition here. All right. I now want to give you the uh, manufacturing uh, report on manufacturing. ID. Hamilton goes to Congress and he gives a report. <clears throat> the purpose of his report is to ask Congress to give him some things and to begin to carry out some policies. These policies set up his vision of what he wants the national government to be. And I've gone ahead and written some of this down for you because I thought it might be helpful to understand what he's doing here. He envisions a strong national government supported by the property and interests. He wants to see the, the, the economy grow in commerce and manufacturing, which is the title of his report here. And he's going to advocate a strong navy to protect our commerce. I've clarified this down here a bit more on the report of manufacturing. There are several things he wants to do here, but he understands that if this government's going to work, the property people of the independent states have got to have a stake in it. Here's what he wants to do. He wants, he's asking Congress to create a national bank, a charter a national bank. He hadn't said anything about this in the Constitution, but he wants them to charter it. And he wants this national bank to issue debt that the federal government will pay back over time. And he wants to assume the debt of all the states that still have debt to pay off in the Revolutionary War. So he wants to say, here's federal bonds, you property people from Massachusetts. You give me your state bonds, I'll pay them off with federal bonds. And it's going to take 10 years to pay it off. And so it's a, it's a swap. So rather than the state being indebted, the federal government is. He's pretty smart here. Because that means the property people of all of those states they're going to get paid back for 10 years, so they can't undermine this government, can they? I mean, they're not going to get paid back unless this thing is still in existence in 10 years. So that's pretty smart on his part. But the other smart thing is, hey, if you're going to have to pay off a debt, then you're going to have to be able to collect taxes, right? That means the government's got to have revenue. And that makes sense because he's going to be Secretary of the Treasury. So now we're going to put a direct tax on all the people. So why don't you write this down? He calls for an excise tax or whiskey tax. A tax on whiskey. A federal tax on whiskey. The reason they do whiskey is because even poor farmers who are off in the sticks, they, they got to go buy some things, right? In a marketplace, they're going to leave their villages and go, well, they got to leave wherever they are and go to a village. You have a tax collector there. What would happen is farmers would brew, they would uh, take their corn and they would distill into whiskey and they would take that because it's easier to carry that for two days to get to a marketplace. But when you come in with that whiskey, the tax collector says we get so much money out of every big jar that you've got. That's how they collected money. Now, what is the government going to use the money for? Well, I've got to pay back the debt. But we also, he believes, that if we're going to grow commerce, we've got to have trade routes. And he, so, so far, he, he wants to move into the interior. So he wants federal roads and waterways. He wants to have the waterways, uh, the big rocks and such, taken out of them. And this, this will all expand the marketplace and make transportation more cheap. The history of this country right here and the growth of business is the creation of roads and railways and canals. And, and that's all been federal and states have done it and sometimes private. But it's a big role here. Now, he also believes in something called the client-patron relationship. As the federal government spends money on something, they gotta find, they're not going to have federal employees doing this, right? They're going to give private contract, contracts to private people. So he creates a client-patron relationship where the federal government is paying money out to individual companies and states. That's going to get them liking the federal government, which is what he's trying to do here, as well as create a bigger 
system. Now, he, he's been reading about what's going on in England. He understands that they're beginning to use machines and mills, and, and he sees the future is machinery and production not by artisans with their hands, but machines. He wants us to grow in that way too. So he would like, but he knows that England's ahead of us and England can sell their products in America cheaper than we can. So he says, here's what we'll do. In order to encourage American investment in manufacturing, we'll put a tariff on things coming from England. That'll make them more expensive. And that will encourage Americans to try to get in to begin to produce too. Only problem is, who's buying these products? The American consumers are paying a higher price than they need to. And who's the beneficiary of that? This is what's going to bug Jefferson. The property class, the capital class, are the ones who are going into manufacturing. And the farmers are having to pay higher prices than they would have to, except for this policy. So this is, the, this is our first big policy debate, is the tariff system. It favors the capital class. Now, he says it's good for America anyway to get into manufacturing. And we kind of almost have to make ourselves do it. Jefferson doesn't like it. He thinks it smacks of elitism. Now we got we got to have taxes. I, I gave you the whiskey tax. We're gonna have land sales. We got the protective tariff for import duties. That's gonna give a, a fair amount of money for the federal government. It can pay off the debt, the national debt. It can build roads and help grow a client-patient relationship. And his vision. This is his vision for America: a robust commercial hubs, ports, and with these roads leading out of Boston to these farming villages. That road will be paid for, he imagines, by the federal government. That would be a good use of the public funds. This is his vision. Jefferson thinks it's all a bad idea because he wants a virtuous republic of yeoman farmers and independent craftsmen, and he thinks the elites are going to... By the way, where does America go over the last two centuries? Did we follow Hamilton's vision? We did. Did we get into manufacturing? Navy? Commerce? Banking? Finance? Does that make us the largest economy in the world with the, most, the highest standard of living? In the world, it does. But we love Jefferson because he's like the guy who's like advocating for the people. But Hamilton is the one who comes up with it all. That's why we put him on the $10 bill. Because he, early on, sees what America needs to become and what role the government can play in. Well, what? remember the government's just the, the people coming together. In this case, the government is the capital class coming together. All right. So, see you all next week. What I'm, well, the reason I'm setting all this up for you is it something we don't usually think about very much. But the hardest thing to come up with is a, a, a republic that has the right balance of executive authority where a competent leader emerges that can run the government for us and not abuse power. This structure is really good. It's as far as, now, this, this is the goal of liberty, is to not have a government that is a narcissistic and self-serving. For the property people, their fear is democracy. What if we let the people completely run things? Might they not be wanting to take things from the wealth? The people, on their part, are thinking, what if the wealthy use the government to further their own economic interests at the expense of the people? So on the one side, the people, are uh, oftentimes feel what is called a populist complaint. And I gave you guys, did I give you guys populism? It's this feeling that the wealthy elite are in a position to control government and they do so at, for their own benefit, but at the expense of the people. Over here on the other side, maybe I should move that, the populist on the left and on the right, we have the property class fears the demagogue. The demagogue, another Greek word for us, coming from, well, dema and democracy means rule by the dems. The dems were created in Athens to create a structure where the people vote in districts for their own leaders. And that was the, that's where we get democracy from that. The demagogue is going to be the ruler who comes from the people from the property-less people who don't have very much and things have gotten worse for them. You remember Nathaniel Bacon, right? He was our first demagogue. He was somebody who saw the anger of all the poor people, the Virginians, and said, the property aristocrats are uh, making policies that injure you. They're not letting you move out west, and it's all about them, and I know this group. Sometimes you get demagogues come from the property class. In fact, they usually come from the property class. And they want to take power, and they make promises for the people who have nothing. And this is what the property people fear most about democracy. Can you all see that? 
because then they might attack property and want to redistribute wealth. So in America, we've had this play back and forth between, a because people are natural, right? The wealthy people think, what policies can we institute that further increase our wealth? That's what Alexander Hamilton's thinking. How can America grow? That's his report on manufacturing. Yes, it, well, here's the idea for Hamilton. Have you ever heard the phrase, a rising tide floats all boats? Right? All boats go up when the tide comes in. So, now, some boats that are bigger and taller, they'll go up higher into the air than the ones that are shorter. Think about that as people. Everybody's going to have more money, but some people are going to have even more because they're the wealthy, they're the bigger ones. So, but the tide's coming up. So, Alexander Hamilton can argue these policies that I want to institute are going to grow America in commerce. And that's a good thing. Everybody gets better off. However, the ones who get really better off are his capital class, the property class. And Jefferson's going to come along and say, no, your policies really are about the domination of the financial capital class over the American government, making things for yourself that aren't good for the poor people. By the way, and Madison, we give it up for him for giving us this system of perpetual leadership where hopefully we have competent leadership coming there. But let's do go and look at a few, again, of Hamilton's policies. Here's what he wants. He wants a, a national bank that can hopefully regulate banking in America to make it more sound. Banks can be unsound. They can issue too much credit and not keep enough money in reserve. And anybody who has money in these banks can lose it all. Today we have all kinds of regulations on banks hoping to prevent that, but he wants a national bank. That's not so bad, right? That's, now it is going to be privately owned by some bankers who are going to get the treasury deposits and hold that money for the government. And they're going to make loans based on that. And they're going to make money based on that. So Jefferson goes, eh, I don't know about that, right? This is a private bank with wealthy people making money on society's money. But the poor people, or the average people, aren't in a position to make wealth on that. But Hamilton kind of thinks, well, that's the, the fees we pay to the managerial class You know how to do this. He wants a system of internal improvements to make roads and waterways. Not only is that good for commerce, but it also helps make um, a lot of people in America like getting this money for a contract. How much money, you know how much you spend on this project out here? All the way over to 81? $26 million. $26 million. That's a lot of money. Um, and it goes to the workers who are out there. It goes to the uh, companies who own the equipment and rent it to the contractor, unless the contractor owns it. And you've got to pay off the re all the resources. But everybody getting a check out there likes these projects, right? And they like state spending. And, and the federal funds are in this, too. So he likes this idea that we get this client-patron relationship between the federal government, who is dispensing money, and the contractors who are benefiting from it. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road. He wants a protective tariff on imported products coming into America that are manufactured because he thinks we ought to get into manufacturing. But the problem is England can do it better than we can at this point in time. But a protective tariff does what to the cost of goods that Americans are buying? Can you help me with that? Thank you. It makes it higher. So the average people are paying higher prices for imported products. Is that benefiting them? No, it's only to help the capital class. And this is where we get an economic policy that is contentious. And Jefferson's going to say, this is elitism. This is the complaint over here of the populace. Elitism. The elites are in a position to pass acts that benefit them and their class at the expense of the people. Furthermore, they're going to have to have taxes to pay for these programs. Is a farmer out there trying to bring a couple of quarts of whiskey into uh, Essex in New Hampshire going to benefit from the road being built down outside of Baltimore? Not directly, maybe not even indirectly. And so Jefferson again says, not good. Elitism. We are taxing the people who don't benefit from it. The question for us is who was right? Maybe they're both right. But they are both right, I suppose. We become, we go into manufacturing. We probably wouldn't have got into manufacturing if we didn't take these protective steps to get the capital class to move their money into creating factories, right? So we benefit over time, but at the time we also have people who are not benefiting from it. But I think the answer that Americans have formed is Hamilton was right. That's why you put him on the $10 bill. 
uh, a guy named George Will, who's a noted thinker from Washington, D.C. He said, if you look around for Hamilton's monument in America, you won't find it. You'll find Jefferson's in Washington. You'll find Lincoln. Where's Hamilton? And um, he says, you know what? We America is the monument to Hamilton because he put us on this path. Again, ticking off a lot of people back then.